So very recently, I was looking around the internet when I discovered that somewhere in Iceland, a group of entrepreneurs from the company known as Climeworks started the largest carbon capturing plant in the world. The facility whose only purpose is to try to capture as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as possible, and then send it really deep into the ground and convert it into some sort of a mineral. But around the same time, I also discovered several papers on a very interesting historical event that happened roughly around 55 million years ago that actually sort of transformed our planet. Hello, wonderful person. Today we're going to be talking about this particular event and what the scientists have recently discovered about one of the most dramatic climatic changes on the planet that released so much carbon that it actually increased the temperature on the planet by roughly around 8 degrees. The event that was so dramatic that if you were to compare this to the average temperature on the planet in the last 60 million years or so, you would see it as a very dramatic peak that happened right here and lasted for approximately 200,000 years. But because of the parallels between this particular event and what sort of is happening today, since 1997 a lot of geologists have actually been studying this event, using it as a kind of an analog for the effects of global warming and the effects of CO2 release, and then trying to understand what exactly sort of happens to the planet when such a huge amount of CO2 is suddenly released into the atmosphere. And so in other words, as you probably have guessed, this is another climate change video. But this one has a slight twist. It's not a negative climate change video. It's a somewhat neutral and quite educational video you probably may want to consider watching. And let's actually go back to that picture I just showed you just to see something really interesting. Notice how the actual temperature goes up but then suddenly drops just as dramatically. And that's actually one of the most interesting and to some extent one of the most mysterious things about this particular event. First of all, we know that the carbon in this case was released for at least 20,000 years possibly even as long as 50,000. But after about 200,000 years, the actual values of both temperature and carbon dioxide levels return back to the levels prior to this event. So let's actually talk about what we think might have happened here and some of the theories in regards to this. First of all, all of this started sometime approximately 10 million years after the original extinction event that sort of made a lot of dinosaurs go extinct. But they're actually not connected at all. These are completely separate events. Now, right after the collision with the asteroid, the temperature on the planet was actually pretty warm. Actually, this is a period on the planet where the polar caps did not exist. You can sort of see how the planet looked like using this beautiful map that's in the description below, created by the brilliant Ian Webster. But the planet sort of looked like this. So, no polar caps, quite a lot of water everywhere. And as you can see, even Antarctica is basically a continent with a somewhat subtropical conditions. But the region we're interested in is right here. And so if we zoom in here, this is what the region looked like 50 million years ago. This is what the region looked like 90 million years ago. And this is sort of how it transformed afterwards. Now interestingly, notice how Greenland in this case starts to move away farther and farther from the future Europe. And as it sort of moves away from here, it opens up this region right here that's currently referred to as the North Atlantic Igneous Province. Now this province is most famous for what's happening on Iceland right now. All of the volcanoes there are basically because of this igneous region, but it was most active approximately 55 million years ago. As a matter of fact, some of the most iconic and most beautiful images from the United Kingdom, so for example this one right here known as the Giant's Causeway, located in Northern Ireland, or this beautiful cave known as the Fingal's Cave, were both formed during this extremely active igneous period. And because of the similarity in age and because of the igneous province suddenly appearing in the North Atlantic region around the same time, a lot of scientists believe that the PETM, as it's known, or Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, was most likely caused by some sort of volcanic activity, and in this case, very likely the North Atlantic activity that created these beautiful features. And although PETM does have other explanations, such as a potential comet, or possibly huge deposits of methane released from somewhere underneath the ocean, in this particular case, some of the recent studies make a definitive case for a volcanic activity in the North Atlantic region. With this recent paper right here, presenting a really strong argument and even explaining what they believe might have happened. And this event is extremely important to understand because, well, first of all, there are unusual similarities between the amount of CO2 released during this event and the sudden increase in temperature and also a somewhat sudden extinction of several species of animals in certain regions or in certain habitats. 
All of this kind of connects to what is happening to Earth today. And because of this, the scientists really want to understand how did the planet first of all recover, but also what's the worst case scenario? What would happen if the CO2 levels really sort of reached the extreme conditions? With the main concern not really being the ice caps or the increase in the water levels, but actually the acidification of the oceans. Unfortunately, the higher acidity in the oceans, which is correlated with the CO2, which ends up producing what's known as carbonic acid, unfortunately does lead to certain species going extinct. And so they wanted to take a look at this and wanted to compare it to what actually happened back then as well. But first of all, I guess let's start with the bad news. The bad news here is that, according to the study, currently the humans are releasing approximately 10 times more CO2 per year compared to the volcanic activity approximately 55 million years ago. But the good news is that the volcanoes here were releasing CO2 for approximately 20,000 years. We've only been doing so for maybe a few hundred years, so we still have a lot of time to somehow curb all of this and to possibly decrease the amounts released. Ok, quick side note, or I guess personal opinion. One of the major issues I have with the governments and I guess a lot of scientific communities communicating the issue of CO2 release right now is that it tells us we're doing something wrong, it tells us that we should stop doing something wrong, but it makes us feel sort of helpless, simply because people are telling us something bad is happening, but no one has actually given us a specific guideline for how to stop CO2 release or for how to stop climate change. Now, this is something I'm going to be addressing in one of the future videos, because I do have some guidelines, but my personal opinion right now is that a lot of us have actually reached the stage of what's known as learned helplessness. It's sort of the stage you reach when you realize that there's nothing you can do. Something bad is happening, everyone is talking about it, it's all around you, but you feel absolutely useless and you sort of shut down and you stop thinking about it, or maybe you start doing something that's entirely opposite. This is actually a really interesting topic and it was originally discovered by studying dogs and specifically by shocking dogs to the point where they would become completely depressed. They would do absolutely nothing and would just continuously get shocked. It's a very sad study and there are some really, really sad pictures I don't want to show, but the study allowed us to understand that anyone can reach this. So if everyone is bombarded with the climate change is bad, we're destroying the planet, but no guidelines are provided and no one is actually giving us any positive or any reinforcing ideas, it actually creates a completely opposite effect. So anyway, more about this later. And more about that later as well. So you know, subscribe if you don't want to miss those videos. Anyway, back to the point. So during that peak, during the PETM, the fossil records show us that approximately 1 gigaton of carbon was released per year for thousands and thousands of years. Humans currently release about 10 gigatons of carbon. And so obviously if we do this for a thousand years, it will very likely have very similar effects. At the same time, same fossils showed us that there was a major turnover of certain types of animals. And this is, I guess, really ironic. Because of this event, or because of these dramatic changes of climate, a lot of species, including early primates, i.e. our ancestors, actually got a chance to dominate their particular habitats. This one right here, known as Archicebus achilles, is one of the most well-known examples from about 55 million years ago and originally came from China. And so the event that sort of created primates as one of the top species by removing a lot of competition is now to some extent also being caused by primates. By us. But the extinction event on the surface of the planet was really not that dramatic and to some extent wasn't even that important. What happened in the oceans though was sort of important, mostly because of the acidification. For example, certain types of organisms living in the oceans, especially the ones relying on calcium to create the shells or any other parts of the skeleton, went extinct, or at least dramatically decreased in numbers. These tiny grains that are only about 5 mm in size still exist today and can be found around certain parts of Japan, and this is known as foraminifera, with the organism in this case known as basugypsina. But the organisms that did not rely on calcium or certain other types of organisms especially certain types of subtropical dinoflagellates, exploded in numbers and took over the habitats that used to belong to other species. So essentially some species disappeared, but some species became way, way more successful. With the fossils suggesting that this was happening pretty much everywhere. The oceans, the land, and very likely affected pretty much every major habitat. So it was sort of like a turnover of species. The animals that used to be successful most likely disappeared, the animals that were not so successful took their place. 
But there were some other major changes to the planet as well. For example, one major change that's somewhat difficult to study and currently is very difficult to understand is actually in regards to ocean currents. Apparently during this time, for about a few hundred thousand years, the ocean currents also changed dramatically, changing the way that the heat was propagated on the planet. Certain regions that used to be warm became much cooler and vice versa. This is by the way something that's already sort of slowly happening on the planet as well. It's not really that dramatic yet, but it is slowly happening. For example, at least one study was able to discover that there was something referred to as the backwards flow, referring to a major change of the water transport in the depth of the ocean, which actually enhanced the warming even more. And so certain types of ocean currents will actually increase the overall temperature on the entire planet. But because of all of these changes, up to about 50% of all of the ocean species very likely went extinct, especially some of the simple organisms that ironically survived the extinction during the dinosaur era. And in this case, it most likely happened because of the length of the event. The asteroid strike only changed the climatic conditions on the planet for possibly a few decades, maybe a hundred years. But the ocean currents in this case very likely were affected for at least 40,000 years, so a much longer period for someone to survive. But what's really difficult to explain and what's actually somewhat difficult to understand is why the mammalian species, especially early horses, early monkeys, and a lot of other mammals that became prominent for millions of years, started to appear and actually started to dominate during this period. Although many of them were much, much smaller in size. As a matter of fact, today it's believed that because of the carbon dioxide levels, or extremely high carbon dioxide levels, the conditions on the planet encouraged what's known as dwarfism. Very likely because the levels of oxygen were sort of lower, and the levels of CO2 were much higher, so it would be much more difficult for a larger animal to be able to breathe and provide enough energy to their entire body. But following this period and following the changes for a few thousand years, there was also a major recovery period. Which means that somehow the planet was able to very suddenly capture and store all of this carbon dioxide, reducing the levels once again. Now this is something we still don't understand, and we don't even understand where the carbon actually came from, but this is an extremely intriguing and very crucial time on the planet that we can technically use as a case study for what might happen in the next few hundreds of years. But back to the study. So what exactly have they actually learned? Well, first of all, they were able to confirm the origins being volcanic. In this case, the scientists were able to confirm that there were very large deposits of mercury present in the North Sea in the North Atlantic. And generally speaking, high levels of mercury are usually correlated with major releases from igneous provinces from essentially volcanoes. Although in this case, it was very likely an underwater volcano, an extremely large underwater volcano, something that would be hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of square kilometers in size. Or to be more exact, this would be an igneous province, so not just one volcano with a single eruption. But basically, a lot of smaller volcanoes here and there, all of them releasing a lot of material. But one major surprise discovered in the study that actually sort of applies to what's happening on the planet today is that only the initial stages of this event showed the releases in mercury, but the climatic changes, the CO2 levels, and the overall temperature on the planet were still increasing even after the levels of mercury started to drop. And what this implies is that the volcanic eruption very likely started the actual process. But once the volcano stopped, something else continuously released more and more CO2, suggesting that there was actually another carbon source that was suddenly unlocked by all of this activity. Or in other words, the volcanic eruption sort of served as a trigger for a release of another source. It could have been coming from some sort of a permafrost in some colder regions, or it could have been very large deposits of methane on the ocean floor, but whatever it was, the initial volcanic eruption that lasted probably a few hundred years or maybe a thousand years, served as a trigger for that secondary emission. The emission that would not happen otherwise unless something disturbed it. And today we believe that something similar could happen on Earth as well. And so in this case, by warming up the planet just enough, we could potentially trigger the release of methane or even more CO2 from some of the regions where it was trapped for thousands or even millions of years. So one such region of course being permafrost. And so this paper definitely suggests that there was some sort of a tipping point. This tipping point mechanism is one of the biggest factors worrying a lot of climate scientists today as well. We don't really know where these major deposits could come from, but by releasing just enough CO2, we could hypothetically 
caused the planet to start warming up dramatically even beyond our control. And because this period right here is technically the fastest period of warming in Earth's history, there's definitely a lot of lessons for us to learn here. But looking back at the graph, we can see that the planets recovered pretty quickly, and this was very likely also the result of volcanoes. Ironically, another study that came out not so long ago talks a lot about this. The irony of volcanoes, or specifically volcanic rock, is that it also tends to trap a lot of CO2 in the long term. And here it's usually the process that we normally call weathering. When the volcanic rocks are weathered, a lot of calcium and magnesium is deposited into the water. And this then ends up producing a lot of calcium compounds and magnesium compounds that have CO2 on the inside, for example calcium carbonate. And so for planet Earth, this actually serves as a natural mechanism to control the levels of CO2. When there's a lot of volcanic eruption, it sort of increases the conditions on the planet for just a little bit, but then the CO2 levels will drop dramatically as a lot of the rock is weathered, and as lots and lots of different sedimental compounds are produced in very large amounts by the volcanic rock. And so in some sense, volcanoes are these thermostats. They control the weather on the planet. They make things warm or they make things cool down. But the cooling down process is usually much, much slower. As a matter of fact, it can take thousands or even millions of years. And so unfortunately today, the amount of CO2 released by humans is approximately 150 times higher than is being trapped by the volcanic rock or by weathering effects. Nevertheless, a lot of scientists have started to think that maybe we can somehow employ this and use it alongside the other carbon capture devices to potentially trap even more CO2 in various deposits. And so here we're talking about what's known as the artificially enhanced rock weathering. The process where the rocks are sort of pulverized, turned into powder, spread across a very large area and are forced to create more carbon compounds, thus trapping even more CO2 in the process. Now this is obviously in its infancy, but if things are going the way they're going, this particular technology might actually be on the forefront of future research. And so I think it's really just a matter of time before someone turns this into some sort of a startup or some sort of an entrepreneurial venture. But the lessons from all of these studies and from essentially all of these investigations are somewhat promising. First of all, the planet seems to recover pretty well. And this right here shows us how well. The recovery only took a few thousand years. But unfortunately for us, we don't really know if we're going to be one of these surviving species. Which is why I personally believe this is still a really important topic to talk about and to not just talk about or to tell people about, but to actually find practical solutions to. Which is actually something we're going to be discussing in one of the future videos. But I guess until then, check out the relevant links in the description, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who was learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.